morning's psalm is going to be on Psalm 8, so I look forward to preaching uh, to you about the wonderful works of God's creation. If you now would turn your attention to the screen as we have our call to worship, and Jeff's going to lead us. Let's stand. Our help is in the name of the Lord. turn in your bulletin to our unison prayer of confession. Uh, we will pray this together, followed by a time of silent confession. Please pray with me. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Friends in Christ, know that we are forgiven through the cross of Christ. Our assurance of pardon this morning comes to us from Psalm 145, verses 13 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord to you. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Spirit of the King of grace and love, the author work. 
So at this time, you can be seated. Uh, we're going to have a video that's going to show us all the wonderful things that the kiddos did at Camp Hoover this past summer, or past month.
That was an excellent video. And great to see all the joy at Camp Hoover. It was totally a blast. I can attest to that for the day and a half we were there. Uh, but at this time, would you pray with me? I'm going to be praying through Psalm 47 and also petitioning for some of the needs of our church. Um, I forgot to mention in the opening, if you're wondering why I'm only here, it's because Phil and Charlotte have both have COVID. So I'm, uh, he was originally scheduled to preach this week, but I'm, going, I'm in his place today. So uh, we'll be praying for them this morning. Uh, please pray with me. O oh Lord, as we come into your presence today and pray through the lens of Psalm 47, we declare, O oh Lord, that you are king. And as such, all the nations are to come and praise you for who you are, because you are the Lord, the Most High, and are thus to be feared. O oh Lord, you are king over all of the earth, and you have sub subdued all people under yourself, most notably through the Son, the, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The nations are your heritage and the pride of Jacob in whom you love. O Lord, may we shout our praises to you. May they be as loud as trumpets. May we sing our praises to you, our King, because you are King of all the earth and worthy of our praise each and every day, from the moment we wake, wake up until the moment that we go to sleep. O Lord, may you continue to reign over the nations. Even in our small congregation, we have many nations represented, represented. And may we see that your promise to Abraham, that through your seed, the nations would be, would be blessed. May we see that on full display in this tiny congregation. Your son, O Lord, sits on his holy throne. The peoples gather around him. And may we find our shield and our strength in you. May you be highly exalted in all that we do here at Christ Presbyterian Church. O Lord, we also lift up those in our congregation, knowing full well that we can come into your presence and pray and beseech you for them. We pray for Casey Rayburn. Uh, we pray for Ron and his continual recovery from COVID-19. We pray for Ruthie and her, her uh, continual battle with pancreatic cancer. Bless her, Lord. Know that you providentially care for her and that you are in control. We pray for Charles Kuhn, for Jim Perkins and his continual recovery. We pray for Josh and Diana. Lord, we also lift up those in our congregation that have COVID, uh, and most especially the Morans. Lord, may those who are afflicted with COVID this, this week know that you are the great physician, that you are in control, and we just pray, O oh Lord, that they would trust in you. Finally, O oh Lord, we pray the words that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord by giving him our tithes and offerings. No. 
Would you please pray with me? Oh Lord, may you take these tithes and offerings and may you use them to advance your kingdom for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Jim Vale. And today's New Testament reading is from the book of Hebrews, the second chapter, verses 5 through 18. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Open our ears to hear and our hearts to understand this passage about him so that our lives may reflect his unselfish love. Hear the word of God. Again, Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 18. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is, why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. 
And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are also being tempted. The word of the Lord. Please stand again as we sing our psalm setting. The text of this psalm comes from uh, a paraphrase by Michael Perry, who is a uh, British hymn writer of the previous century, and he's done a wonderful job of illuminating many of the themes of this psalm. Uh, your part is going to be in yellow. Anytime you see that on the screen, it will be your portion. Uh, it's just the refrain of the song. So watch for the yellow text and uh, sing along when you see it. We'll demonstrate first, and then we'll ask, us, ask you to join us.
Our sermon text is Psalm 8 today, but before I go ahead and read it, let's pray. Oh Lord, as we come into your presence today, uh, on our drive-in perhaps, we saw all your beauty and all your splendor portrayed in creation, but it pales in comparison to who you are in and of yourself. And so Lord, as we come to Psalm 8, may we seek your face and may we see your splendor for who you truly are, the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, Psalm 8 is our sermon text this morning. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all the sheep and the oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord. Now, when uh, I was originally supposed to preach next week, but again, Phil um, has COVID and I, I believe he's recovering and doing well, but still continue to pray for him. Uh, he told me that I could have a free choice on which psalm to preach through. And since uh, he let me know uh, the week after Camp Hoover, and you saw that wonderful video this morning, fresh on my mind was Psalm 8 because Zoe and I had just trekked all the way up to Camp Hoover uh, in McCall and saw all the beauty and splendor of the Lord on its full display. Uh, and so what inspired me was, it's one of my favorite psalms, although I say that about every part of the Bible, to be honest, or whatever I'm preaching on this week. Um, but whenever I think about creation, in my mind, it always goes to Psalm 8, which, is, which always starts with and ends with, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is, all, is your name in all the earth. Now that week, um, Ezra was a little bit under the weather, so he couldn't, unfortunately, make it to Camp Hoover, and Sarah had to stay home with him, but Zoe and I got in the car and went up to Camp Hoover, and usually when people say went up to, they don't really mean actually physically went up to, but the drive up to McCall is physically going up, um, because I actually checked the elevation and started at, in Boise, roughly 2,700 feet, and then we almost doubled as we ascended up to McCall at 5,000 feet. Um, just by raise of hand, who's been to McCall before? Okay, everybody, great. I'm try as I'm getting to used to being your pastor, it's really, as I experience the things you experience, I'm looking for things that everybody's experienced to draw commonality. So I feel like I'm becoming an Idahoan, if that's the correct word, because uh, I can actually use experiences that everybody has had. Um, the drive started out quite lovely as we were driving through Horseshoe Bend, um, and you kind of go down that giant hill, and if you're still kind of in that desert climate, but it's marvelous nonetheless. But as you get to the bottom of Horseshoe Fall, it feels like you just gradually start this ascent forever and ever. I know, if I, memory serves me correctly, is it pronounced the Payette River? Yes. Okay. Apparently, the Californians pronounce it Payette. Is that correct, too? <laughs> Okay, I see a lot of eye rolls, so I wanted to make sure that I got it right, the Payette River. So you start to go up that hill, which is interesting, because in the Psalms, it off, when you go up to God's presence, um, you go up to the mountain, so to speak, but you start that trek up, the Payette's on your left, and as you're going up for like that endless hour where you feel like you're going to fall into the river, so to speak, um, the only difference, one of the differences um, that I've, I noticed and was talking to Phil about. He's like, what's your general impression of Idaho? And I, I said, well, there's not really many guardrails. Uh, and he said, <laughs> he said, and I experienced that going up the Payette, and he said, in Idaho, we give you the permission that if you're dumb enough to drive into the river, we're going to let you do that, <laughs> which I thought was really funny, but that's what it felt like. So we went up that, that trek, and then you get into kind of the flatland, so to speak, um, 
I'm not an expert on terrain, but you have all these beautiful mountains around you. And the last trek uh, that we did, which was from Cascade to McCall, you have all these beautiful and lovely mountains around you. And it's just beautiful to see God's creation on display from that, that little drive. And even though it's about two and a half hours, um, there's just all these different terrains, all these different beautiful things on display. And I kept thinking to myself, uh, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, Psalm 8 uh, is written in a context before the fall of man. And I want to bring in another great commentator of Scripture whose name was Augustine of Hippo or St. Augustine. Um, many have heard of him. But when I was reading through Psalm 8 and translating through it and kind of trying to get the gist of it, because I'm familiar with it, but it's always helpful to slow down and really digest the text slowly, um, it reminded me of Augustine of Hippo. And when Augustine of Hippo was praying one day, he sat next to the beautiful ocean. I believe it was the Mediterranean because he was in Carthage. Um, not an expert on geography, but he looked out into this beautiful ocean and saw the beauty and splendor and thought to himself, uh, and he recorded this in his writings, if that is how lovely a fallen world is, imagine what the age to come is going to look like. And I think that's kind of what Psalm 8 is trying to do. Um, it's written after the fall, but in many ways, Psalm 8 is an imagine, imagination exercise of what it was like in Genesis 1 through 3. All that creation language is there. So that's the kind of mind frame that I would like us to get into. Think about the world and all its beauty and splendor before sin, death, and disease infiltrated this world. So please turn to Psalm 8, and we're going to slowly work through the text. Now, 8-1, that phrase that I keep repeating and is repeated in our songs, which is great, because if you walk away from our sermon today with one thing, remember, just remember Psalm 8-1 and, and in the end. O oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. But many of us might know this verse. We might have memorized it as a child. Um, it might be in our hearts and we say it whenever we see uh, creation in all of its beauty and splendor. But there's a lot of important theological concepts in Psalm 8-1. First, that name, O Lord, notice in the ESV it's all capitalized. Um, the reason why it's all capitalized is it's the covenant name for God. When Moses encounters the Lord, um, he goes back to the children of Israel, he descends down the mountain because he's meeting them on top of the mountain, and he says to the Lord, who am I to say sent me? And God responds, I am sent you, or the Lord sent you. This is the most holy name for God. So holy that scribes, when they wrote it in their Bibles, did not allow us to know how you actually pronounce the word. Uh, and you weren't allowed to pronounce the word in public. I even, actually, Jews still practice, practice this to a certain extent today. I had some uh, Hebrew professors and in seminary, you kind of wake up from PTSD having Hebrew because you just go around in a circle and you, you state it in Hebrew and then you translate and you're like, oh, I hope that class is gonna let out because I don't wanna read this and get corrected by my teacher. Um, it's, it's not the funnest experience, but it pays off after a while. Anyways, long story short, the reason, reason I'm saying this is because I had professors who did their PhD at Jewish, Jewish institutions and they still were not pronounced allowed to say the, the so-called Y word or Yahweh. But this is the most holy name for God and Psalm 8 starts out that way. Uh, God's name is his revelation. And what I mean by that is God is transcendent, uh, he is almighty, and he is the one who can create the heavens and the earth by the, by the very word of his mouth. But that name for God, the most holy name, is not meant to alienate us. It, the text follows up with our Lord, and that Lord, which is uh, capital, and then the rest in lowercase, is Adonai, which is just another name for God, and God providentially cares for us. So if we feel alienated from I am the most transcendent being, the fact is that God is also intimately uh, providentially watching over us as well and his creation. So those two words for God or those names for God are really, really important. And if you miss those, you're going to miss the depth of the rest of Psalm 8. God is majestic. Uh, the psalmist is emphasizing his kingship. And just by his name, his glory is revealed. Psalm 8.1 also does an excellent job 
teaching us that creation is not the actual God. God is personal. He created it, and we are, when we see creation all of its splendor, it is to point us back to him. Uh, and also, if you think this earth is quite glorious in a, in a fallen world sense, it doesn't compare uh, to God's glory. So that's the opening section. Now, in response to God's name, uh, his name is Revelation, when we look out into uh, creation, we might feel insignificant. So the knee-jerk reaction might not be to praise God for who he is, but it might make us just feel in- insignificant. And what I mean by this is remember, so- think about Psalm 8 in its original context. Imagine you are a shepherd boy in Israel watching over your sheep late at night. Maybe one gets away, I don't know. But you're sitting there uh, watching your sheep, and there's no light pollution, and you look up to the skies and see all the stars and all of their glory. Has anybody actually seen stars without light pollution before? Okay. Um, my reaction to it sometimes is all their beauty and splendor is we tend to look down upon ancient people and say, why did they worship the sun, the star, the moon, and all this stuff? And I look and I'm like, well, they're absolutely beautiful. And I could kind of see and I'm sympathetic to why they would do this. But another reaction might be to just feel insignificant. When that shepherd boy looked at the heavens and saw the work of God's fingers, the moon, the stars, which he set in place, um, the world is just a massive place, and you could just feel like, is there anybody else out there but me? It's really striking in 8.4 that the psalmist responds, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? So this devastation that we might feel, perhaps if you've ever been to the, to the Grand Canyon and just feel as small as can be, um, you might think, why would God even think about me in the first place? The creator who actually built all of this thinks about you and cares for you. Um, so devastation is not the complete way. Um, we feel that when we look at creation, but the psalmist is reminding us that God is intimately involved and he cares for us. His goodness and his providence is all around us. Now the psalm continues in another section. What is humanity's role? And this is another reason why I picked it as well. The children, um, their curriculum for Camp Hoover was all centered around the image of mankind. You can kind of see it in the videos. I guess if we post this online, you can go back and see um, Pastor Mark teaching. He had the mirror. I think what he was probably... I have to guess, but I'm going to guess that he had the kids looking in the mirror and looking back at themselves and saying, you are an image bearer of God. That's my guess, but I'll have to check with Ellen if that's right. Oh, did, did you say that's right? Okay, great. That's right. Um, <clears throat> but the Psalm, Psalm 8 really drives home who are human beings and what is their purpose. Again, working back to Genesis 1 through 3. God has made us a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned us with glory and honor. Um, This draws our attention back to the creation story. It teaches us who we are. In 8.6, the Lord tells us that he gave us dominion over the works of his hands. So he created it. We are to rule and reign over it. God has put all things under our feet. In other words, in 8.6, I think humans are portrayed as the crown jewel of all of creation. Um, It's interesting. We really, in this maybe too much sometimes, respect creation. And um, there's this, all these movements to to restore it and to care for it. But if you think about it, human beings are actually the crown jewel of God's creation. And maybe when we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ, we should behold all the glory of God in that way. Um, As beautiful as the mountains and the the sea and and everything that's around us, but God made humans as the crown jewel of his creation. Thus, all things are put under our feet, the sheep and the oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, what everything, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. That means everything is put under our dominion. And as human beings made in God's image, we are vice regents of his rule and reign. That's just a way of saying that he has allowed us to subdue the earth and bring it under um, his dominion. Um, 
The interesting thing about Psalm 8 as well is it doesn't use language that's just past-oriented, like we just read it and think about the shepherd boy looking up to the stars. It's still being fulfilled now. Um, And the way I think about this and apply this is whenever um, scientists find new creatures that we didn't know about before, um, what is the first thing that they do when when they find them? They name them. Uh, It really brings our attention back to Genesis 1 through 3, where Adam is subduing creation by naming the creatures. We still have this happening. And apparently this happens in the sea a lot because it's really deep uh, and there's a lot of weird creatures that live in there. But nonetheless, humans are still bringing all of creation uh, under their dominion. But all of this was lost in the fall. And we need to think about that as we work through the text. In response to all of this, who God is by his very name, uh, what was lost by the fall, uh, how we peer out into creation and feel small and insignificant, the psalmist nonetheless pushes us in 8.9 to praise God for who he is, drawing to our attention again to that verse, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, Psalm 8's interesting uh, because Jim read a text that brings it into conversation in Hebrews. And what I want to pitch to us this morning is to work back through it, more or less through the eyes of Hebrews. And I want to point to the idea that without the eyes of faith in Christ, we as individuals are just going to look onto creation and just project whatever meaning onto it that we want. And I wonder, again, as you slow down, uh, digest the text, wrestle with it like I did this past week, when humans look to creation and all its vastness and it's just big um, and it just makes us feel small, I sometimes wonder if the overall rise in depression and anxiety, and I'm not talking about clinical depression and anxiety, but just people are anxious and when, whenever people do... Uh, self-reported um, surveys of how they're doing in life. They just, a lot of people just seem to be miserable anymore. I don't know why. This is just what I, I read in the news. I wonder if that's linked to people not knowing what their God-given purpose is in life. Uh, and that's what I love about Psalm 8. It draws our attention back to what our original vocation is. We don't want to be like that as a congregation this morning. We want to understand creation properly. We want to understand who God is. Uh, To praise God for who he is is therapeutic. In other words, to understand it properly is to heal our soul and to understand our purpose in life as individuals. So what I'd like to do is work back through the psalm in three distinct ways. Uh, There are three different ways that you could apply the text to your life. Uh, You can pick one and focus on it this week as you pray back through Psalm 8. You could pick two, or you could pick all three. I leave it up to you. You are able to choose. But there's three things that I see in the text that are helpful. Um, The first one, uh, as we bring Hebrews into conversation, is the Lord's condescension. The fact that God has not left us alone. In fact, he has stepped into time and space and saved us. So, the Lord's condescension. So, the Lord and all of his uh, power and glory comes down to us. The second one, and this is what John Calvin kind of focused on in his commentary, is Psalm 8 reveals to us the Lord's providence, that he cares for us. Um, So, we'll work through that. And finally, um, I'd like to engage us in an imagination exercise and think about the beauty and splendor of the state of Idaho, which I'm gradually learning more and more about each and every day, um, and to think through it and pray Psalm 8 in conversation with it. So again, these are the three ways that I think we can approach the text. So let's start with the first one, the Lord's condescension. The good news today is that God has not left us alone. Uh, If we look at creation and all of its beauty and splendor and feel small, like God doesn't care for us, he in fact does. And he does uh, not just care about humans, but all of his creation by stepping in time and space from his holy mountain, the Son of God, and taking on flesh through the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Lord in his glory condescends to us and he seeks and saves the lost. 
It's just a good exercise to look at creation in all its beauty and splendor and say, wow, um, not only did God create that, but he loves me so much that he took it upon himself to come to this world as the first missionary and to save me. Now, as you read the Hebrews text, it comes across as a little bit unnatural, I must say, in its interpretation of Psalm 8. I really had to wrestle through this this past week. Um, really, is Christ located in Psalm 8? Um, and I would wrestle with it and wrestle with it and wrestle it with it. And finally, I came to the conclusion, yes, it does speak about Christ. Because in our Psalm today, it's dripping with language about Adam. Um, Adam in the sense of a real historical person, but Adam also is more than an individual person. Adam means humanity, um, Adam, it just means humanity. So it's one of these interesting things where Adam is an individual in time and space, but he is also more than a particular person. It's all of humanity. But Adam in scripture falls. Um, he, his purpose was to rule over creation as God's vice regent and he failed miserably. Um, that is the imagination exercise of Psalm 8. But the good news is that where Adam failed, Christ succeeded. It is through Christ's condescension that humans find their true meaning and purpose in life. I know I had spoke about a couple minutes ago about people just don't know what the purpose of in life is. And we know as Christians the purpose in life is to become more and more like Christ uh, over and over throughout our life. The Spirit gets a hold of our heart, gets deep down inside our bones, and He transforms us into the last Adam's image. The man who walked in complete wisdom in Psalm 1, um, who meditated on the law day and night, that's who we are transformed in, into, and that is our purpose in life. And blessed is all those who take refuge in the last Adam. So that's the first part, God condescends to us in Christ. The second way we could go about uh, Psalm 8 is thinking about God, God's goodness or providence towards us. And as we actually work on our statement of faith, that's actually uh, affirmation of faith after the sermon. That's why I picked the Belgic Confession, Article 1, because it has all this declaration of God, God's goodness and care for us. God indeed cares for us. He is watching over us. If we look to creation and feel um, our smallness, it's okay. God really cares for us. He loves us, and he is watching over each and every step in life. As individuals who have one step in old creation and one step in new through the gift of the Spirit, life can, in fact, be difficult. Um, life can feel like it's endless streaks of good fortune or bad fortune. Um, it just feels, I'm talking about us as individuals here, it feels like life can be kind of random at times. D does anybody ever feel this way? Yes, okay, you can raise your hand. Um, the interesting thing is throughout human history, there has been other traditions that think through um, how to cast aside good or bad fortune in life. Um, I just finished a book recently on a, on a, it wasn't really a religion per se, but a philosophy of life called, they were called the Stoics. Um, they also interest me because they're gaining popularity recently. A lot of young men in particular are interested in um, Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, um, if these names ring a bell. I, anyways, they're really popular, it's really fascinating. But I read a book about them in uh, the early Christian tradition uh, and just finished it this past week and it was marvelous. One of the things that was interesting about Stoics that I learned was Stoics, one of their big things was life is unfortunate and unfortunate, unfortunate events happen to us. And the important thing is how do we react to those events? And the Stoics had all these practices that they did um, where they would call it building your fortress against the bad, um, events that are going to happen in life because they're going to happen. Um, it had a lot of commonality with behaviorative cognitive therapy where you just kind of think, you know, in, this, in the way you just kind of like think your way out of problems. Um, but really what they're trying to do is get you to wall yourself out from unfortunate events in life. And uh, luck featured heavily into their tradition. 
Now, as a Christian, it was interesting reading this because I don't think there is such a thing as luck, uh, to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars. Although, Obi-Wan Kenobi, maybe I'm dating myself there or not. Uh, but Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars says to Han Solo, there's no such thing as luck. And I can remember as a child, my dad saying, that's right. But my dad didn't draw my attention to the providence of God, so to speak. But that's why I object to luck. Um, we don't have to wall ourselves from bad fortune in life because... God cares for us, and his goodness is on display. And I think Psalm 8 does that. God is both transcendent, and he is also personally caring for our life. So Pastor Phil last week mentioned that the Psalms are an invitation to wrestle with God. And I think that's true. Um, I really think that's the heart of the spirituality of the Psalms. It's a wrestling match. It's a wrestling match that never ends for all of your life, so to speak. It's hard it's sweaty, and it just never ends. I was asked to wrestle in high school for heavyweight, and I said, no way, I'm not wrestling because it's hard and it's sweaty, and and it's not fun. I'll stick to baseball where I don't have to make contact with people. But prayer is a wrestling match. And if you're struggling with the providential care of God and his purpose for your life, wrestle through Psalm 8. God just didn't speak the universe into existence. He cares for it as well, and he cares for you as, your, as his crown jewel of all of creation. He is indeed watching over your life. So think about the providential care of God. And finally, uh, I'd like us to think about the creation of Idaho in particular, inspired by my trip uh, to Camp Hoover, Zoe and I's trip to Camp Hoover. So what I'd like you to do at this time is close your eyes. And I can see you so you can't cheat, close your eyes. Uh, Think about the most beautiful place that you have seen in Idaho so far. Okay, so think about it. Gather that image. Behold that image with all of its beauty, splendor, and glory. Imagine how long it took to get there and how long it took the Lord to form and fashion it over many, many years. Okay, you can open up your eyes now. Now think about that opening praise statement, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And what I would like you to do throughout this week is to take that image in your mind, think about it, get it deep down into your bones, and think about the fact that that's beautiful. Um, It's amazing who God is, that he created this world. But think back through the idea that God loved you enough to come into this world and to save you, And think about God's providential care in your life and think that humans, not just us as individuals, but humans in general, are God's crown jewel of all of creation. Um, Even if that image of Idaho and all of its beauty and splendor makes you feel small, and it makes me feel small, um, know that you are not alone in the universe, but that God is watching over you. So, in conclusion... Even though I just told you to imagine Idaho in all its beauty and splendor, it's important for us to realize that this world is indeed passing away. I don't know what it fully looks like uh, in new creation and how things will turn out. I can imagine what it'll look like, but I imagine when that day comes, it will just completely blow me out of the water. Um, But let us, as Psalm 8 does, turn our attention upwards towards the Lord. If we can walk away from one thing in Psalm 8, it's that we need to focus on God for who he is as the creator. My prayer is that we are a congregation that understands that God's very name reveals who he is and that we praise the Lord no matter what is going on in life. May we be a congregation that knows we are not left alone in this universe by chance. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for you, for who you are. You are the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Lord, when we see creation and all of its beauty and splendor, may we praise you for who you are. In times of despair or when we feel distraught, uh, may we turn our attention to the fact that you stepped into time and space and saved us. Lord, may we know that you providentially care for us In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd invite the congregation to stand as we unisonly affirm our faith.
and the Belgic Confession, Article 1. Who do you believe about God? We all believe in our hearts and, and confess, confess with our, our mouths that, that there is a single and simple spiritual being who we call God. He is eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, and the overflowing source of all good. God's benediction and blessing to you. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now it is time for our dismissal. Church, where are you going? Glory to God.